there's going to be some activities um, in the room at the very end. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This evening, I just wanted to kind of start with the common denominator, the lens, the lens by which we read the readings of every hour, we go through every day, we go through Pesto with. And it's a lens that, that's important to keep, our, keep in our minds. And I'm sure you already know this, but I find myself repeating myself often. If you notice within the Bible and within the readings, every reference, every reference to his death is coupled with a reference to his resurrection. They're always together. They're always together. Even in the agony of the cross, on the cross, Christ is still glorious. He is still victorious. With everything that goes on through Passion Week, the church is always seeing two things at once. It's always seeing the cross, but it's also seeing the empty tomb. The empty tomb is always there. And if anything, the early church for centuries, it's the image of the, early, of the empty tomb that even superseded the cross in a way, because that gives the cross meaning. One of the greatest indicators of that is just simply art, simply art. Yeah. When you look at the first six centuries of Christianity, there, there really aren't crucifixes. There are a lot of crosses, but they're all empty. They're all glorified crosses. They're all crosses of the resurrected, the resurrected Lord. And even after the sixth century, when the crucifixes, uh, uh, crucifixes become more popular, it's takes it a couple of centuries to catch on. It's always the empty cross. Without that lens, without that lens of the empty tomb and the empty cross, the cross is just simply a horrible instrument of death and torture and human cruelty. Through the lens of the empty tomb, it is God's power, it is God's love, it is God's grace. There's a lot of sadness in Holy Week, but we're not at a funeral. Spoiler alert, we know how it ends. It doesn't end with mourning, it doesn't end with weeping, it ends with rejoicing and victory. The victory of the one through whom we become more than, more than conquerors. The readings of tonight, the readings of tonight are kind of transitional. You kind of notice the progression at Holy Week, Passion Week kind of starts off with Palm Sunday, and in Palm Sunday there's a lot going on. There is the entrance of Christ into the temple, there is the crowds shouting and cheering, so on and so forth, and, and then it kind of settles down a bit. The readings for Monday night, Basca readings, Monday nights so or Sunday evening, through yesterday, through today, through the ninth hour, are primarily teachings. There's a couple of things. There's you know, Monday morning, there's uh, the readings about the throwing out the money changers, but that we're reading on Monday morning, but it really happened on Sunday. Uh, the fig tree, but beyond that, it's primarily teachings. It's not really events. The transitional point is the 11th hour that we just read, where the, the scribes and the Pharisees, now the chief priests, now they're starting to plan, now they're starting to put out their feelers. They want to arrest the Lord. And events start to accumulate after, after this. For those days, for those days in which not a lot of events are taking place, we do know what Christ was doing. 
who would go to the temple and preach and leave. And it's almost as if the church has us there at the temple with him hearing his preaching or hearing that those messages he's getting. And they tend, especially yesterday and, and today, to really focus on two, two main themes. The first, again, both yesterday and today, is watch, be vigilant. Be alert, be ready. On Tuesday nights, 6th and 11th hour, on tonight's 3rd and 6th hours of the night, that is the same message coming up over and over again. Be ready, watch. When you look at the other Gospels, and actually even those ones, but when you look at the other Gospels that we read, in many ways those are about, well, watch for what? Be prepared for what? Be vigilant against what? And when we look at them, we find that the message is a little alarming. It is watch itself, be vigilant, be ready. It, it, it is kind of provocative. It, it's prompting us to be ready for something, be ready for what? Now, even I, when I go through this, I have to remind myself of God's tenderness and love because God forbid what he's warning us about comes true. But over and over again, whether it's the first uh, hour of the night of Tuesday, the ninth hour, the first six and ninth, uh, ninth hours of tonight. There are warnings to those in the church. They are not to the outsiders. They are warnings to those who believe that they are inside. Wanted to focus a little bit tonight with you on the gospel of the sixth hour, that of the ten virgins. Now, parables in general are a little bit difficult to interpret. They're seemingly simple stories, but they're incredibly complex, and they're full of mystery. And one of the more difficult is, is that parable of the ten virgins, because some aspects of it seem very straightforward, very clear. Other aspects are full of mystery. And the danger with parables is that if you don't push their interpretation and flesh them out correctly, it's equally as dangerous as not doing so. And when you look between really the Orthodox and Catholics and Protestant churches, especially with uh, the Orthodox and Protestant churches, you'll see that how we interpret parables, these seemingly simple, benign stories, differ in very significant points. And the, the difference makes a huge, huge distinction. The parable, the parable starts, the kingdom of heaven is like, as many, as many parables begin. And if you can remember just some of the imagery, it's, all, it's a little bit all over the map. Here, repeatedly tonight, we heard of the kingdom of God is like a banquet, a, a wedding banquet, a wedding feast, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But in another parable, it's like a mustard seed. In another parable, it's like a gnat. And it's like, well, why is this so enigmatic? It's, it's different aspects of the kingdom, this different vantage points onto the kingdom. For the first and 11th hours tonight, it's the wedding banquet that Christ is going to accept his church as his, as his bride. In many ways, this is what we celebrate in every Eucharist. Every Eucharist is a celebration of a wedding feast. Early Christians, again, 
I don't know why I, I have art on my mind today. I don't know why. But when you look at the very earliest art of Christians in the catacombs, when they were still hiding from the Romans, a lot of what survives there are images of banquets, of banquets. This is how they are viewing, viewing their Eucharist. This is the heavenly banquet that is awaiting them. As we push, as we push on, we get to the parable of the virgins. Now, there's a few basic things, but they're very important things to know. The virgins, all ten, are going to this wedding feast. All of them are, are invited to the wedding feast. All of them are going with the intention of meeting the groom. Now, it's clear that this is not the world versus the church. This is not those outside the church and those inside the church. These are, have all received the same invitation. They're all answering the same invitation. They're going to the same place and they're expecting to see the same bridegroom. And each of them is coming with their lamp. And in various passages of scripture, the lamp and the individual are kind of uh, synchronized. They're, they're said to be one and the same. Even Proverbs 20, the spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord. The eye being the lamp of the body. The lamps and the individual coming through are often one and the same. Now, initially, all the lamps are filled and all of the lamps are filled with oil. Now, what is this oil? Some have said that it is the Holy Spirit, that it is the grace of God, that is the Mayrun that we all receive in our baptism. And this is the oil that brings us uh, throughout this life. And then any of these three, and all three, can, can pre present us with the meaning of that oil. But there's a couple of things important here. The first is that that oil they initially have in their lamp, this is what gets them through the first part of their journey. This is what lightens their way. And when you read the account carefully, they, this, this wasn't the journey they started during daylight. This is a journey they, at some point at least, if they didn't start at night, they are in night because they use up that oil. This oil is what is guiding them through that night. In many ways, this is kind of similar to us. We are we navigate we navigate a dark world, an ever darkening world, but we navigate through that light of the lamp that we are given, that oil that is given to us, the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, the Mayrun. This is when we follow the light. This is what leads us. This is what guides us. And among this group of 10, now we kind of know that there are foolish and wise virgins, but among that group of 10, initially, they don't know. They just, they have their lamps are going. Some of them bought oil. Five of them have oil that they bought. And they took it with them. This is important because they're going to need it later. But they bought it early. They bought it. And they can purchase it. Because later on, when the foolish virgins run out and they're told to go, go buy some, uh, it's middle of the night. Well, who's going to be selling oil in the middle of the night? It can't be purchased at that time. And then they all slept. They all slept. They went, they used up their oil, were waiting for the bridegroom, and they slept. Now here, the sleeping, some have said that this is the sloth and uh, the weariness of the world. I tend to prefer here the sleep being death. And as John 11, 11, sleep is but a little death. And there's so many passages in the scriptures in which sleeping and dying are analogous. 
And then the bridegroom comes. Bridegroom comes. And they all rejoice. This is what they came for. This is what they came for. They, they hear and they hear the, 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 the voice sound. Them. Behold, he is here. Come to meet him. The one you have been waiting for is here. But now, but now the oil is run out and they have to relight the lamps. Now the initial oil they had, the initial oil they had got them to the destination. The initial oil they had got them to literally the door of the banquet hall. It got them to be in the presence of the bridegroom. They just need a little bit more to enter. And it's at this moment now, and it's at this moment, that the foolish and the wise are differentiated. Up until this point, they all received an invitation. They all made the same journey. They all have the same expectation. They're all waiting. They all slept. But now, now, this is where the foolish and the wise are differentiated. The wise are able to relight their lamps and to bring in that extra oil. The foolish, the foolish says, we all know, are told to go buy it from somewhere and they have nowhere to buy it from. And as they search, the door is shut. The door is shut. And then they come back. And they come back somehow. Maybe they found oil. Maybe they didn't. They found their way back to the, to the banquet. And they're knocking. Lord, Lord, let us in. He looks at them and he tells them, I do not know you. I don't know you. How can you not know them? You invited them. They were there because of the invitation that you extended. They're there explicitly to attend your banquet, your wedding feast. How can you not know them? This is where we have to break down this parable. And again, that, that importance of sleep and the symbolism of sleep being, being death. That extra oil, that extra oil cannot be obtained after the slumber, after that death. It has to be something brought in beforehand. This is something that we have to equip ourselves with now. What is this oil? This is where, oh, if I, if I didn't already tax your patience, this is where I'm going to tax it even more. Because this is where we get into these esoteric discussions about faith and works and grace and so on and so forth. Fathers, it's within the traditional uh, understanding of this parable that extra oil is the piety, the virtue, the holiness, the works of those virgins. that is attained in this world before they sleep that will allow them to enter that allowed them to enter into, into the banquet. There's a lot to say here. Unfortunately, when we speak about grace and works, works has become a bad word, and it's overwhelmingly misunderstood. We live in a largely evangelical Protestant uh, nation that really has this problem with the word works and that colors our discussions and our perceptions of what work is. It's like, well, salvation is by grace. It is not by works. You can't earn your salvation. Well, I'm not quite sure who argued that you can't. That you can't buy your salvation. Well, for one thing, uh, God isn't selling. And if he was selling, who's going to afford the price? 
we get wrapped into these bizarre, odd conversations. What is the importance of words? What are words? What is this extra oil that we need that we need to have? For one thing, these words, and we'll define them a little bit clearly in a moment, but these words, they are a product of grace because he is the one that gives us the will, gives us the ability, gives us basically everything, except just we, we just have to follow. We have to add that one missing ingredient, our will. Why? This goes all the way back to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis. Because if we follow kind of much of what is out there outside of the church, the idea is that, well, Adam and Eve, they were given this great gift of free will. They messed it up. And hence, they have no more free will. And hence, God came and he did everything for them through his grace. End of story. It makes the whole gift of free will come off as a failed experiment by God. That God gave humanity free will. It didn't work out. So he said, all right, we're, we're not going to mess with this again. I'm just going to have to do everything for them. They don't need to do anything. They screw it up anyway. Now, if that was God's attitude to begin with, he would have just kind of annihilated humanity and started all over again. But he doesn't do these, this that way. He restores. He does not destroy. Just as from the very beginning, Adam and Eve are given everything. They're given everything. But God wants to give them this free will and the ability to exercise it. That they need to exercise it just to provide that token of their appreciation, thanksgiving, and will. He does the same when we discuss works. It is not that our deeds are great. It's not that they are mighty. And as I was saying, that even the grace to think of what to do, how to do it, and the ability to do it, all that is coming from him. But there is a human element. There must be a human element, be, not because I say so, but that's the original plan. That's what he did in Genesis. If he wanted beings that he's just going to take care of completely without any free will on their part, he could have done that. It would have, <laughs> it would have saved him from the cross. That is not the original purpose. When we speak about this extra oil, that extra oil is still grace, but it, you have to buy it. You still have to want it. You still have to implement it. Not that you're buying your salvation, but that you are given that grace to become a co-worker with God. That is part of his plan. When we speak about works, first and foremost, performing good works is simply obedience. It's simply obedience. What kind of children of God, what kind of children to any father are those that constantly disobey? Just a lot of what we're asked to do is just simply obedience. He asked us to do it. He instructed us to do it. When you remove kind of the, the exteriors and you look at what exactly are the works that the church speaks about. These are not works as understood in other traditions and religions. These are not works in an Islamic understanding where Ramadan, if you feed one person, according to one hadith, it's, it's, it's as good as 
feeding 10,000 individuals. God is going to give you 10,000 merits. All of our works, all of our works are a mystery in this participation, in our participation in that mystery of being co-workers with Christ. All of our works are in imitation of Christ. When we speak about forgiveness, why forgive? Because Christ said so. And not only did he say so, he demonstrated it on the cross. When we show compassion, we are simply mimicking the one who showed compassion not only for each of us individually, but for our whole race in congregate. Whatever we do, whatever we do, these works, these works are all bring us closer to Christ. This language that St. Paul constantly uses, in Christ, putting on Christ, that needs a manifestation that needs to be relayed somehow. And it is relayed through our actions, relayed through our works. Even, even in this parable, even this parable, and again, uh, it really has to be understood as a parable for those inside the church, because at the very end of it, that last verse, it's addressing the whole church. Watch, watch that you do not know the hour or the day. Be on guard, be ready. Make sure that you're not caught without that extra oil. And glory be to God. We ask and entreat you, O Lord, our God, the Father, the Pantocrator, and the only begotten Son, who created and ordered all things, and the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, and the Holy Trinity, before whom every knee bows in heaven and on earth. We ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. For the sake of the heavenly peace, unity of all churches, and the moral monasteries, and all holy places, their dwellers, and their keepers, O oh God, have mercy on your creation and save it from all evil. We ask you, O oh Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. We give you through your power, dispose the life of man before his creation, made all things with your wisdom, and adorned the skies with the stars, the earth with vegetation, trees, and vineyards, and the valleys with pastures and flowers. Now, our King, accept the prayers of your servants who place themselves in your hands, saying, we ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O great and holy God, who created man according to your image and likeness and gave him a living and rational soul, have mercy, O Lord, on your creation which you have created. Have compassion on it and bestow upon us your mercy from the height of your holiness and from your prepared dwelling. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. Oh, you who saved your servant Noah the righteous, his children, their wives, with the clean and unclean animals from the flood in order to renew the earth, we ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. Oh, oh, you the creator and provider of all, deliver your people from the flood of the sea of this passing world and protect them and the animals from all harm and provide the needs of the birds as you provide for all birds, animals, and ravens their sustenance. We ask you, Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. We are who received as a guest by your servant Abraham, the patriarch, ate at his table and blessed his seed. O our king, now accept the prayers of your servants and priests who place themselves in your hands. Have compassion on the world and save your people from every hardship. Dwell in them and accompany them. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. We ask you, O Lord, to guard us from all evil, to have compassion on your creation and all the people, for the eyes of everyone look upon you, for you give them their food in due season. 
You are the sustainer of all flesh, the help of those who have no help, and the hope of those who have no hope. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. Oh, you who look to the humble with watchful eyes of protection, who saved Joseph from his master's wife, said him over the beach, and spared him in the days of hardship, so that his brothers and fathers came, and father came now before him and took from him wheat for the sustenance of their children and animals. Likewise, we bow down and kneel before you, O oh, our Creator and Provider, and thank you concerning everything and in everything. We ask you, O Lord, save us from all tribulations. We ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, Lord, the Logos of God, the Father, who works through the law of the prophets in the Old Testament, who fills them and save your people from all hardships and manage their lives according to your good will, save them from all famines and calamities, we ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. And you have supported the people of Israel for 40 years in the desert of Sinai, having neither houses nor storehouses. Now, O oh my Lord, protect your people, support them, and bless their homes and storehouses with your heavenly blessings. We ask you, O oh Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, you who accepted the prayer of Elijah the Tishbite when the sky rain and the earth gave fruit, and bless the barrel of meal and the vessel of oil in the house of the widow. Accept the prayers of your people through the intercessions of your holy saints and your prophets. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O oh God, with eyes full of mercy, have compassion on the world and bless their crops and their storehouses. Even the little that they have, raise the waters of the rivers according to their measure and give good temper to the winds. Bless the rivers this year and every year. Give joy to the face of the earth and sustain us. We ask your Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. O <clears throat> oh, you who accepted the repentance and the vice, when they fast and receive the confession of the right hand deep from the cross, likewise make us worthy to please you and to gain your compassion, crying out and saying, Remember us, O oh Lord, when you come into your kingdom, accept the repentance of your servants, their confession, their fasts, their prayers, and their offerings, which are offered on our on your holy altars, as an acceptable incense, and have mercy on them. We ask you, Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, you, mighty provider, chastiser, healer, and physician of our souls and bodies, who tested his servant Job, healed him from his calamities, and recompensed him with more than what he had. Have mercy on your people and save them from all calamities, tribulations, trials, and hardships. O you the pulled of those who trust in you, we ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O Christ your God, the Logos of the Father, who sanctified his holy disciples, washed their feet and made them leaders of the believers and guides of faith, who through them satisfied the hungry souls and taught them to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, you who works miracles and wonders, who fed the thousands with the Bibles and raised the dead and blessed the wedding of King and Galilee, now, O oh Master, bless the bread, oil, plants, and beehives, the trades, the products, and all the works of your servants. We ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, oh Lord, save your people and protect them on every side. With the sign of your life giving cross, raise the state of the Christians throughout the world. Soften the hearts of their rulers towards them. Fill their hearts with compassion towards our brethren, the poor and the needy, and keep every evil away from them. We ask you, O oh Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. You entrusted us with your holy covenant, your body and blood on the altar by the descent of your Holy Spirit on the bread and wine, and commanded us, saying, This do in remembrance of me. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O oh, Christ our God, have mercy on your people and the successor of your apostles. Bless the fruit of the earth and give gladness to the heart of man through the abundance of fruits and blessings. We ask you, O Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. 
Glory God to the Father who was incarnate from the blood of Virgin Saint Mary in the fullness of time, who said unto your holy apostles, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Be also with your people who cry unto you, saying, We ask your Lord, hear us, have mercy on us. O forgiver of sins and provider of all things, forgive the sins of your people and purify them from all blemish. Cleanse them from all deceit and keep them from bearing false witness and from all envy and slander, uproot from all their hearts, all evil thoughts, murmuring, unbelief, pride, and hardness of heart. We ask your Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. The most salvation of the oath of us, the invincible fortress, bring to naught the counsels of your adversaries and transform our, the sorrow of your servants into joy, fortify our cities, defend our Orthodox leaders, and pray for the peace of the world and the churches. We ask you, Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. O oh God of mercy and compassion, the Lord of all comfort, do not be angry with us, do not rebuke us for our evil deeds, nor for the multitude of our sins. Do not be wrathful with us, nor let your wrath endure forever. Hear us, O oh God of Jacob, and look on us, O oh God, our helper. Protect the world from death, scarcity, plagues, devastation, the sword of the enemy, earthquakes, horror, and all fearsome events. We ask you, O oh Lord, to hear us and have mercy on us. For the sake of our protection under your mighty holy hands, O God, we ask you to keep for us the life of our honored Father, the Patriarch Pope Abba Tawadu II, and his partly possible with your Father, Metropolitan Abba Serpent. Confirm them on their thrones for many years in peaceful times. We ask you, O Lord, hear us and have mercy on us. <clears throat> O Christ our God, we ask through your goodness of your great mercy to keep for us the life of our fathers, the metropolitans, the bishops, and all the leaders of the flock. Confirm the sheep of your flock, grant protection to the priests, purity to the deacons, strengthen to the elders, understanding to the young, chastity to the virgins, asceticism to the monks and nuns, purity to the married, and protection for the women. We ask your Lord, hear us, have mercy on us. We ask for the safe return of the travelers, support for the widows and orphans, abundance for the poor, those who are in debt, pay their debts and forgive them. Those who are in prisons in distress, give them release. Heal the sick and repose the 